Welcome back to the Tapes Archive Podcast, where we release interviews that have never been heard before. In this episode, we feature baseball icon Hank Aaron. At the time of this interview in 1995, Aaron was 61 years old and was promoting the upcoming premiere of the documentary based on his life, Chasing the Dream. In the interview, Aaron talks about his hunger to play baseball, the importance of speaking up about wrong in the world, and how he wants to be remembered. As always, we have music critic Mark Allen at the helm conducting the interview. Thanks for tuning in, and now it's time to open the vault. Hi, Mr. Aaron. Yeah. Hi, it's Mark Allen. Thanks for talking to me. You work for the Braves now, right? CNN. Oh, you work for CNN. Okay, I'm sorry. What, what is your title? Sorry, what you said? I, I was asking what, what your job is at CNN. I'm with the Apple Channel. What is that? Just, uh, you see these apps. You see the, the TVs in the airports. Okay, I didn't realize they had a separate channel for that. Yeah, okay. Apple Network it is. Okay, and, and do you have a, an official job title? No, I, you know, it's, it's a lot of politics that goes involved in trying to get airports to let us come in and put these channels in, you know, because there's a lot of resentment among store owners, you know, who's in there. They don't want people sitting out watching the news because it takes away something from them. They feel like it. And, of course, every airport has an airport authority, and they, right. you've got to deal with all that politics. They have to deal with politics, deal with the airlines and all that. So, uh, and the airlines don't want you to put the wrong thing on there because, God forbid, if you have a crash, people don't want to sit there and look at a crash. And that's right. So there's a lot of politics involved. You know, that's basically what I do. Okay. Well, let me ask a few things about the movie. Did the movie come out the way you expected it to be? Yes, it did. I was very pleased with that. I thought that Michael Tola did an excellent job. Did you have much of a hand in it? Were you involved? Yes, I did. Okay. Yes, I did very much. Tell me what you did. Well, I mean, every part of it that they went through, they sent me a part of it so I could see it and book it. Every time they would shoot a scene, they would come back and they would show it again. Do you like it? Is it okay? And so I had to either book it or didn't. The, the scenes that are recreated of, of you as a kid and, and of your family home and all that, hey, how real was it, I guess? Yeah. It was about as real as it could be. You know, you mm-hmm. have to realize that some of it had to be presentation, you know, but, but most of it was real, you know, like, uh, in fact, most of the people that was in there, you know, I was surprised that he, you know, Michael did a, did a hell of a job of finding these people. I can't even find them myself. <laughs> come by and find them, but... Um, I would say almost, if I had to put a percentage on it, I would say almost 95% of what happened in that movie was accurate. Wow. Okay. So that's that's great. And I had a reason for doing that because I didn't want a baseball movie. I wanted something that I think that everybody and every kid could be proud of. You know, I mean, I, I didn't want somebody saying, well, I can't get a home run because that, that was not what the movie was about. It was about some trials and tribulations. Yeah, uh, tough times, you know. Yeah, yeah. It, do you know what it is about you that that enabled you to weather those tough times? I mean, is it something inside you? Can you can you put a finger? I really can't say. You know, I I suppose uh, anybody I could. There was the good Lord that gave me the ability to withstand and, and to go through some of the things I had to go through and uh, and keep my eyes on the prize. What I was there for, you know, to do. You know, that's the way baseball. My memories of you um, are, you know, as a great, consistent, dangerous hitter. And the quote that I remembered from from you out of out of everything you ever said, I think you said something to the effect of, "I'm not trying to make them forget the babe, only to remember me." And the movie, you know, just gave me such a, a more rounded picture of you. Um, is it, do you think people remember remember that you were an activist? That they that they remember that you spoke out for uh, for integration and, and all? Well, you know, I I don't know how people gonna re- remember me most. Whether they, you know, most people say, I remember you for the home run you hit. I remember you for being the kind of ball player that you were. I remember you playing in the World Series and etc. You know, all of that is fine. You know, I mean, that was uh, all of those things were God-given talent. Uh, I think that uh, if people want to look at me and say what type of person you really were. Uh, I would for what was right, you know. I think that when you see something that's basically wrong, and it's my opinion and my voice, speak out on it. You know, start speaking out on different issues and things that I see that is wrong. I'm not trying to start anything. I'm not trying to put my name up, my little my picture in the headlights or anything like that. Uh, I just basically think that uh, everybody, no matter whether it's black, white, or green, has the right to speak out on behalf of what sees. It's going on wrong, you know. 
He must have had people at the time, though, telling you, don't say anything, right? I mean, there, there was a scene in the movie where um, when the, he had bought the car and the, the guys tried to run you off, or they did run you off the road, and you said that you or the narrator says that the teammates seemed almost more interested in you not talking to the press about it than, uh, than how you were feeling. So I, I take it that there were times where people must have said to you, Hank, could you not could you not talk about that? Well, you know, a lot of people are uncomfortable with the truth, you know, especially when you start talking about things like what's right, what's wrong, integration, and segregation, whatever you want to say. You know, a lot of people are just uncomfortable with that, you know. And to answer your question, yes, I, I was told not to say anything, you know, but you know, I just felt like, why shouldn't I, you know, why shouldn't I let people know what was happening? It was just absolutely wrong. You know, I could have been killed and <laughs> nobody still would have known anything about it, you know. Watching the movie, I, I, I felt a real sadness in that it seemed like you, you couldn't enjoy anything about breaking the record or the accomplishments, some of your accomplishments. And I'm wondering, are you able to enjoy it more now? Oh, yes, very much so, more than I did then. I, I'm at peace with myself now more than I was then. But by the same token, it was hell. Yeah, I caught a lot of flat. I caught a lot of hell. It was uh, I, I couldn't go anywhere. I couldn't do anything. I couldn't enjoy my kids. I couldn't enjoy the chase in which I was going through. So to ask you a question, put it plain bluntly, I am really more at peace with myself now than I was back then. Is that just a result of, of having time on your side now? I think time heals a lot of things. But you have to remember that this is a new generation of kids, generation that looks at it. It's been, what, it's 74, you know, so it's been a long time that record's been broken. You know. This is a new generation of people, and I think I've been, more, I've been appreciated more by this generation than I was at a generation before. Is it just because we've made some social progress in this country? Yes, Do you think that's right, it? Yeah. right. And I think people look at people. Uh, we've made some progress in this country. I think people look at you a little bit different from 25 or 30 years ago. In the film, there, there are several instances of juxtaposing you and Martin Luther King and what was going on at the Times. There's no mention made of, of Malcolm X. Were, were you uh, interested in Malcolm X? Did Malcolm X have any bearing on you? Oh, I, I respected him very much, so mm -hmm. I just, it, just, it just happened to, to put Dr. King in there, you know. But I respected Malcolm X very much, so a lot of things that he said was very, very true. A lot of things he did was very true. A lot of things he prophesied, a lot of things that has come true, you know. So I had an awful lot of respect. I just didn't. It just happened that way, you know. So that's just the filmmakers, that's yeah, not that's you. Okay. Filmmakers, yeah. We were talking about not enjoying the record. We, uh, this season we watched Cal Ripken break that record, and did you feel, I mean, you probably, you more than anybody else, had some idea of what he was going through with all the, the press and well, they counted. But I don't think that he had anything near, near of what I went through. Well, he didn't have the hatred, that's for sure. Oh, that's what I'm saying. So he, I, I think that Cal uh, was able to enjoy the record, as Pete Rose was able to enjoy breaking Ty Cobb's record, but mine was altogether different. You know, it was when you first started getting letters about, you know, hatred and death threats and things like that, did you understand that at all? I mean, because it seems like it must have been a really foreign experience for I you. I was confused. Yeah. I was confused. I didn't know whether I was doing something wrong or what. Then I started thinking, I said, hey, you know, uh, you got some sick people in this country, you know, regardless of whether they're black or white, you just got some sick people that uh, don't want to see anybody move, you know, and yet I look back and I start really thinking about it, you know, uh, and it wasn't so long ago that they broke this record, you know, I mean, they tied this record, you know, 714 home runs, you know, and I look back and I said, and reading all of the clippings across the country, the newspaper clippings across this country, all of them, I mean, to a, almost to a T, would tell you that the most unbreakable record would have been the 714, 714 home run. And absolutely no sports writer was there that that record ever going to be approached. And yet when I broke and when I broke it, when I played and I broke it, it became secondary. Then it was the sixty, it was it was Joe DiMaggio's hidden streak became the unbreakable record. Then after that it was the Lou Gehrig <laughs> yeah. game record. So, you know, every time something happened it always plays that little part of it down. And yet, you know, there's nothing I can do about it because my mother always said things you have no control over don't worry about. So I, you know, as I said before, I'm in peace with myself and I don't worry about it. I don't have any control over what they put in the history. 
you played uh, for the Indianapolis Clowns, and uh, but the Indianapolis Clowns never really played in Indianapolis, <laughs> did they? It was more of a bond stop. It's it's probably likely that unless you played a Triple A game here, you never played in Indianapolis, did you? I don't know that I did. You know, really, I'm trying to think of that. I, I think I did play a game in Indianapolis. I don't know whether it was with the Indianapolis Clowns or whether I was with the uh, in the major leagues or what. You know, I, I really don't know. I, I let me just say this: not too many cities of state that I didn't play in. Right. <laughs> <laughs> you know, when you played as long as I did, you make them all. Uh, yeah, and one and, way or the other. And considering you were 20 when you made it to the majors, right? I was. Uh, well, I just turned 20. You yeah, just turned 20. 20. Yeah, right. Yeah, I mean that's amazing. Considering guys aren't making it until they're like 25 now. In a lot right, of cases. right. Johnny Bench uh, has this great quote at the end of the movie about um, saying, you know, he would he never thought of himself getting a tattoo, but if he were in your position, maybe he'd get like I hit 755 homers tattooed on his forehead. And I wonder, you are, are you know so famous and so legendary, and I just wonder, do you wait, ever wake up in the morning and just say to yourself, "Geez, I'm Hank Aaron." Not really, you know. Yeah. I think I've taken that with a grain of salt. You yeah. know, um, uh, you know, all of the accomplishment and everything that I've accomplished while I was playing baseball for 20 years, in which I was blessed and long enough to play. I have to give credit to a lot of people. You know, I played on some very good baseball teams. I played with some very good baseball players. I was spared going into service for two years. Uh, I didn't ever have what they call a major major injuries, you know, I did have my both ankle crack, but it wasn't like I was going to miss a half a season. So I was blessed in more ways than one, you know, and sometimes I look at it and say, it was good to get to do something incredible, and that's what happened, you know, the good Lord looked after you, you know, because I did come up with 18 year olds who was going into service. I was right in the, in the middle of the Korean War. When they were drafted 18 year old, you know, and especially black kids, you know, if you were 18, you, your chances of going to service, you, you were there. I was spared that, you know, I, I went and took my physical and I passed the physical. And then uh, I was scheduled to go into service that next year. And when they got back to me, I had two kids. So they, they said, hey, we can find somebody else. You know, they don't want to pay for that, you know. So it's all of that, you know. So it was, I was lucky enough to do it that way. And then, you know, I broke my ankle. I broke my ankle the last September the 5th. The season was over with. I had all one of the recuperate. And, and uh, then I was fortunate enough to move to Atlanta where the weather was very, very conducive and good for me. And my style of hitting, I just began to start pulling the ball. And I was playing with some very good ball players. I was blessed to play with Matthews for a number of years. He and I pulled all time record for home runs. So, <clears throat> And later on, Rico Carter and Joe Tour, and you, know, you just go on and on and on. So all of these things just put together, you know, I mean, it spelled success, and uh, uh, I just took advantage of it. You mentioned in the movie, uh, at one point you were making $200,000, I think. Is that, how, is that Was that pretty much your top salary? My top salary was two forty. Two forty, dollars Isn't that right. unbelievable? <laughs> I want to ask you this in a couple of ways. I mean, one is in the movie, there's a scene of you in the World Series hitting a, a, a basically a 460-foot triple. Do you think the game is, is easier now? I can't say. You know, I really can't, I really can't say. You know, I haven't, I'm, I'm not played it. I don't, I don't know. Uh, I really can't answer that and be honest with you because I don't know all of the things. You might, you might ask somebody who's playing today, might say, hey, it's harder to play today than it was for the guys that played when I was playing I think somebody when I was playing, they may say it was harder to play then than it is today. You know, I, I really don't know. You know, the only thing I can say, in all fairness, is that athletes today can stay in better shape than athletes was a few years ago because they don't have to worry about going to work the next the day after the season. You know, they can build their own gym in their house and they can do whatever they want to do now. I, I, you know, I don't know. You know, but they also have to take into consideration that players today, athletes. They, they jump further, they run further, they do a lot of things better, you know, than athletes said. they did when I played, you know. So, you know, but it's hard to say, you know. Somebody gonna tell me that Ted Williams couldn't hit it in a year in any year. He, he, they gotta be crazy. They tell me Willie Mays couldn't play in any year, you know, they gotta be crazy, you know. So they can't tell me that Maddox couldn't pitch in any year, you know. But I don't you know, so it, it's kinda hard to say, you know. It, it really is hard to say. Uh 
whether it was easy to play then as it is to play now. You know? And when you look at the money that the guys make now, do you do you have any particular feeling about that? Is it too much or is well, it? Well, you know, I, hey, you know, I, 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 can't, I can't say whether they make a hell of a lot of money. <laughs> I didn't make it, and I wished I had made it when I was playing. It wasn't there, but uh, I don't begrudge any player that can make everything that he can make. You know, you see franchises now moving from city to city, for example, football is beginning to have a a rush like a Russian roulette, they're just jumping from city to city. I think what I see is that there is no identification for a team. Just recently, you saw Cleveland Brown moving to Baltimore. One of the things that really came through in the, in the movie is how much you loved baseball when you were a kid. And kids today don't seem to have that kind of affection for the game. And uh, I'm wondering why you think that is, and what do you think baseball has to do to get that back? Well, I think one reason because players, you know, like, for example, like Deion Sanders plays baseball, plays football, plays basketball, play all these different sports. And I don't think they ever refine the sport that they should be refining. You know, Deion is a hell of an athlete, and he just gets the minimum out of what he can do. He's a hell of a football player, so he makes quite naturally, he makes more money out of football than he does out of baseball. And I think he can be a hell of a baseball player if he, if he should put his mind to it. I think that's one reason, because players just don't refine the game in which they uh, can play the best. Okay, but he's just one example. I mean, what else do you think? I know there was... It well, it's the same. It, it happens in college. That's where it happens. Players play all different sports, basketball, football, and they play all of them. Oh, okay. So you think when they start as kids, they should start in the I sport? They should thing. play with one sport. The only thing I want to do is play baseball, and I thought I had my hands full of trying to, trying to play that well, as I could. Baseball's racial barriers were, uh, I mean, Jackie Robinson had everything to do with it, but, but ultimately it started out by Branch Rickey's decision. And I'm wondering, could it, was there anything that, that black ball players could have done on their own in those days to start the integration process, or did it have to come from Rickey? Yeah, you couldn't have started anything back there on your own. You had to come from somebody like Branch Rickey, bring in somebody like Jackie Robinson to make sure that things went over smoothly as it did. I don't think that anything that any black player could have done that. He couldn't have forced owners to sign them. They couldn't have forced to go with certain clubs. You know, that's why they formed the Negro League. So it was kind of tough, but uh, it was just lucky enough that Branch Rickey saw what was happening and gave blacks an opportunity to play in the league. But nothing the players could have done no, to force their hand. Okay. Can anyone break your home run record, do you think? I don't, you know, I, I, don't, I don't use never. Well, that's a word, word that uh, I don't think that should be used because anything and everything is possible. If, you, if somebody had said 100 years or 50 years ago, would anybody go to the moon? They said never. I can't say that. Would anybody would have said that uh, Babe Ruth's record would have never been broken? They would have said never. Ty Cobb's record would have never been broken. They said never. I certainly believe that it is possible. I think any and everything is possible. A person can dictate what they want to do. The only thing that's standing in their way now is whether they're going to be hungry enough to play 23 years, and that's the key to it. You know, and now if they're not, then they're not going to break it. You know, I mean, I was hungry. It wasn't like after I played 15 years that I was financially rich. That was not the case. Right. You know, I was still hungry. You know, I was hungry because I had a family to, and I had other things to look after. You know, so I, I was very hungry. You know, even when I broke the record, I was still not making money that I should have been making. That could be the case with a lot of ball players played in my area. You know. It's got to make you feel good at the end of the movie when you got Ken Griffey Jr. and Frank Thomas and all the other great home run hitters of the day saying, "No way can we break that record." Well, it makes you feel good. But uh, here again, as I said before, it seems like it's so far out of reach, 755 home runs versus whatever they got, 100 home runs or 200 home runs, because it just started their careers. But as I said before, you know, the older you get and the more you keep doing things, you keep doing things on a regular scale and get to a point where you level off and you hit 35 or 40 home runs every year. You know, these things, uh, every year they add up. And the first thing you look around, you say, hey, I'm within striking distance of doing a lot of things, you know. But you look around today, and I mean, and I guess, and I hope you think this is an okay comparison, but I was thinking that probably the, the most comparable player to you right now might be like Eddie Murray. And Eddie Murray's nowhere near your home run total. And I, I just think of him in the same light because he's a very consistent player. He drives in 75 or more runs every year. He hits, you know, in the high two, you know, 300 or thereabouts. I, I can't imagine that anybody could do it. Well, the important thing is player with the ability and want to play and stay hungry enough. When you come here, do you have to make a speech? 
I don't know. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> if I do, they better hurry and tell me. I don't have anything prepared. <laughs> I'd say you probably have a few anecdotes in your in your past you could talk about, but uh, yeah. But anyway, um, is there anything else that you want me to tell people about you or the movie that uh, we haven't talked about? Uh, I'm just uh, looking forward to being in that company. Mm-hmm. Okay. All right. Well, I really appreciate your time. It's a, it's an honor to talk to you. You're thank you're you. great. Okay. Thank you. Take care. Bye. Hey, thanks for listening to the Tapes Archive podcast. Please remember you can always find more information about the show and the individual episodes at our website, thetapesarchive.com. Until next time, the vault is closed. <laughs>